tuned in to Cool Ghoul Radio. Don't miss a second. We got one, Dean said and pulled off onto the dusty desert road leading to a small rundown storage unit. A bright neon green poster board sign with a crude estate sale scribbled in dry marker had grabbed Dean's attention from the road. He was a scrappy young man in a fitted Nazareth shirt and ripped jeans who wasn't one to pass up a good sale. The swap meet had been a fat bust and he hated going home empty handed. Willie, Dean's nephew, sat in the passenger seat. The swap had been good to him. Eyes pinched and a broad smile across his chubby face, he counted the dollars he made helping folks load and unload their purchases with his Red Rider wagon. Let's see what we got, Dean said. His seat fell already off and the door of his blue Datsun opened before he put the truck in park. You coming, small fry? I'm good, Willie said and went back to counting his money. Suit yourself. Looks like they got a box of comics, though. No shit, Willie said. He stuffed his money in his pocket and fumbled at his seatbelt. Yes, shit, and watch your mouth, said Dean. In the shade of the empty unit sat a tanned old man in an aluminum web lawn chair. Next to him sat a cooler of bud and water, the mountains in the process of turning blue. The old man had spread the unit's cargo out on a fold-out table and two brittle tarps faded from years in the sun. He dabbed the oil and sweat from his wrinkled face and waved to Dean. Dean gave a nod and went to work. He walked along the tarps, his eyes trained to pick out hidden treasures amongst the weeds of junk. He was good too, better than most folks. His daddy, who worked swaps for a living, had taught him the skill as a child. Dean stopped halfway. Nothing but warped vinyl in egg crates, stained kitchenware, and tools who had seen better days. The sale looked to be a bust, too. The sun had reached peak height and Dean felt the warm sweat on the back of his neck. The day was getting hotter, and they had an hour's drive in a run-down old truck and no working AC ahead of them. He'd given Willie the last water bottle, too. Probably ought to cut this short, he thought. Dean wiped his face and neck and gave the estate sale one last look. A large circular object leaned against a table leg, wrapped in a deep purple blanket and tied shut with a bailing twine caught his eye. A small silver cross on a chain draped over the top. What's this? He asked the old man. Dunno, ten bucks and it's yours, he said, and dabbed his forehead and neck. Can I take a look? Dean asked. The old man leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. Knock yourself out, he said. Dean lifted the cross off the frame and set it down on the tarp. A faint electrical tingle spread from his hands throughout his body. He ignored the sensation, tugged at the twine and pulled the cloth aside to reveal a large mirror. Its frame was cherry wood, hand carved with a western theme. Two crossed pistols sat atop the mirror. The smoke from their barrels fed into a stampede of horses, whose dust trails became the clouds in the sky of a carriage robbery. The frame looked new and polished, but the mirror had a thick layer of dust. He had never been one for lavish decorations. In fact, the only decorations in the house were the wall of vinyl album covers he collected over the years, and the framed band flyers he had pulled off the telephone poles in his youth. The mirror was different. He traced a finger over the intricate details carved into the wood and admired the craft and care how the artists had used the swirls of color in the cherry wood to draw your eyes through each scene. Dean was lost in admiration. The world and its heat had fallen away until a stray bead of sweat ran into his eye and the sudden sting of pain brought him back. Ten bucks? Dean asked. Ten bucks, said the old man. I'll take it, Dean said. He paid for the mirror, and Willie paid for a stack of old Spider-Man comics he'd found, missing their covers. Blackfoot set a steady rhythm for the drive home. Rough and scratched from overuse, the gentle fuzz of the tape transformed the music into white noise with a beat. Willie fell asleep by the second song. His Spider-Man comics spread across his lap. Dean thumped his hand on the outside of the cab's door to the beat of the music the whistle of the road in one ear competing with the steady rock beat in the other. 
The two-lane desert road stretched to the horizon with no other cars in sight. The long, twangy whine of the harmonica signaled the start of Train Train, and Dean began to hum along with it. He leaned back in his seat, one hand at the base of the steering wheel. He slowed the truck down to match the speed limit on the posted signs, which flew past long enough for the number to register. The weekend hadn't worked out for Dean. He barely made half the money he expected to make from the swap meet, but the season had only started, and he had plenty of opportunities to make money. Still, the trip hadn't been a total waste, he thought. His eyes drifted to the rearview mirror. Propped against the back window, wrapped in purple cloth, and Dean's oily jacket for extra protection, sat his prize. He hadn't properly rewrapped the mirror, and part of the glass peeked through, reflecting bright bursts of sun when the light outside hit just right. The lines of the road flew past in rhythmic yellow flashes. Dean squirmed in his seat. He couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. He stared out at the mirages appearing and disappearing along the hot asphalt. He tried to ignore the feeling, but the sensation grew stronger and the jitter set in. His legs started to bounce, his muscles tensed, and he thought he'd shake the truck apart until he looked into his rearview mirror. He caved and stole a quick look. Nothing but the mirror. You're being silly, he thought, and shook his head in amusement. Having got his fix, his legs stopped bouncing, his body relaxed, and all seemed right with the world. Dean turned into the gravel driveway to his older sister's house, ignoring the Please Drive 5 sign they posted to minimize the dust. The Datsun slid to a stop outside the house. A wall of dust seconds behind engulfed the truck and Willie's folks, who had come out to greet them. Deborah Lee was ten years older than her brother and had settled into a comfortable middle-class life with her husband Richard Lee. Her husband Richard, a good four years older than Deborah, stood next to her. Christ, Dean, Deborah said. She covered her face with her shirt until the dust settled. Sorry about that, Dean said. He was already out of the truck and lifting Willie's Red Rider wagon out of the back. How was he? She asked while she helped Willie out of the passenger seat. Real entrepreneur you've got there, Dean said, getting back in the truck. That's what I want to hear, Richard said. He gave Willie a hearty pat on the back that almost caused him to drop his comics. Hey, I gotta head out. I gotta take care of something, Dean said, and put the truck in reverse. Hot date? Richard asked. Something like that, Dean said. We got takeout thinking you'd be staying. Deborah said. Next time, Dean said. He waved goodbye and dove off in a cloud of dust. Dean backed into the driveway next to his small mobile home. The unshakable feeling of being watched returned. His eyes drifted from the large wooden gate that separates the driveway from the backyard, where he'd unload the truck to the mirror propped up against the back window. Barely visible over the hood of his Datsun stood the shadowy outline of a man in a wide-brimmed hat and a heavy duster jacket. The features of his face appeared smeared, like someone had run their thumb over a wet painting. Dean looked from the mirror to the front of his truck. No one. The trailer hitch hit the wooden gate, and the Datsun jerked to a stop with a loud crack. Ah, shit, Dean said, and put the truck in park. He slid out of the cab and checked the gate. The hitch had punched a hole between two of the boards. He'd just restained the boards last week, and now he'd have to replace two of the boards. There went what little money he'd made at the swap. He ran his hand through his hair. Today's shaped up to be a real shit show, he thought. A slow but nervous feeling crept from the base of his spine to his neck. A chill followed close behind. Dean's attention turned to the mirror in the back of his truck. He'll have to deal with the fence later. Right now, he had other things on his mind. He cleared a space on the wall in his living room, right above the television and overlooking the two worn couches covered in cigarette burns and a pair of mismatched afghan blankets. The mirror looked out of place between the rabbit ears covered in tinfoil and surrounded by ashtrays and empty cans, but Dean didn't care. Dean grabbed a couple of beers from the fridge and placed a TV dinner in the microwave. 
He cracked a beer while he watched the plastic food tray turn in the microwave. A slow, exhaustive sigh escaped his lips. <sighs> the persistent fear of something he couldn't place had finally vanished. The feeling had dogged him since the estate sale, and he felt relieved at its absence. He leaned back against the door of his fridge. What a day, he thought, and took a long drink. He sat down on the couch, the TV dinner hot on his lap, and his two beers balanced on the armrest, stained from years of spilt drinks. He got comfortable and turned the TV on to the usual Springer Marathon that ran every Sunday. A guilty pleasure on days he felt bad about his situation in life. Things were tough, but at least they weren't Springer tough. Night had come, and the glow of the street lamps mixed with the flicker of the TV basked the mirror in reflective blue light. Dean had fallen asleep to Springer, which had since switched to the nightly news. The two beers he drank lay next to him on the couch, his TV dinner tray fallen between his legs. Dean's head was back, his neck stretched and exposed, his mouth open. The steady drone of the newscaster warbled. The picture stretched and distorted before snapping back into place like a rubber band. Dean shifted in his sleep. The picture flickered, the newscaster's voice becoming a staccato stutter, every other word cut off. Above the TV, the mirror reflected the dimly lit room. A small ripple, like a pebble dropped into a pond, flowed from the center of the mirror to its edges and back. The TV responded with a sharp electrical beep, and the picture cut out, basking the room in darkness. The TV came back to life with deafening white noise and snow. Dean snapped awake. Fumbling for the remote that had fallen between the lumpy couch cushions, he turned the TV off and fell back onto the couch. Dean swallowed hard, trying to catch his breath, and slow the beat of his heart. His eyes wandered from the TV set to the mirror and his own reflection. Deep within the reflected room of the mirror stood the silhouette of a man in a wide-brimmed hat. His shadowy body blended into the shadows on the wall. Dean's body prickled. An electrical vibration crawled over his scalp, standing his hairs on end. He stared into the mirror, unsure what to do. The figure stood still. Dean squeezed the remote in his hand and turned around, brandishing the remote like a dagger. Nothing. A cold chill ran down Dean's body. He searched the room and blindly reached for the old touch lamp which sat on the end table. He knocked away the empty can surrounding the lamp and tapped the base twice. The light barely illuminated the room. Two of the four bulbs had burned out long ago, and Dean had never bothered to replace them. He patrolled the room, remote still in hand, and worked his way through the rest of the house. He checked every window and door, all locked. A trick of the light. Or the booze, he thought, and went to bed. He didn't bother to turn off the lights. Friday night meant card night in Dean's mobile home. Deborah, Richard, and Willie arrived earlier than their usual time of six sharp. A week had passed and they hadn't heard hide nor hair from Dean since he dropped Willie off after the swap meet, and this doubled as a wellness check. Dean met them at the door, unshaven and still dressed in his oily overalls from scrapping metal all day. He rubbed at his red eyes, the dark bags under them popped against the sickly pale complexion of his skin. Jesus, Dean, you look like hell, Deborah said. Good to see you too, Dean said and stepped aside to let his family in. We couldn't find a sitter, so we brought Willie along, Richard said, and scooted his son in who was nose to page in one of those Spider-Man comics he'd bought. Doing some redecorating? Richard asked, gesturing with his thumb to the bare wall above the TV. Uh, something like that, Dean said. Deborah grabbed the trash bag propped in the corner of Dean's dining room already half full of old dead beer cans and TV dinner trays. She picked up the empty beer cans and unopened mail littered across the fold-out poker table. Long nights, she said, holding up an empty bottle of Trucker's Delight caffeine pills, one of several she saw laying amongst the beer and mail. 
Long scrap in days, Dean said. He tried to meet his sister's gaze, but couldn't. She furrowed her brows at her husband and gave her head a quick jerk in Dean's direction. He picked up on the not-so-subtle gesture. Got something going on, Dean? Richard asked, his voice soft but stern. Dean looked from his brother-in-law to his sister. He started to say something, but hesitated. Then, you ain't gonna believe it. I need to show you something, he said. Dean led them down the hallway to his guest room. I've been keeping it in here, he said, and fumbled for the keys in his pocket. Dean missed the lock on the first two attempts, but slid the key into the door's lock on the third. The room was dark, except for the faint glow of the back porch light diffused by the thick curtains drawn over the window. The mirror sat in the corner of the room, wrapped in the dark purple cloth. The silver cross hung loosely from the top of the frame. Maybe I'm going crazy, but there's a man in the mirror, Dean said. Richard looked from the mirror to Dean. You know how mirrors work, right? He said. I know, but I mean, there's another man in the mirror. Like a shadow man, Dean said. I've seen him at night, moving around. But I figured it was a trick of the light or something. Willie's folks shared a look of concern. That trucker speed ain't doing you no favors, Dean, Deborah said. I'll prove it to you, Dean said stuffing the silver cross in his pocket. He untied the bailing twine and let the heavy cloth fall to the floor. Willie sat in the hallway, reading the second issue of Spider-Man he'd brought with him, his back pressed against the door. Above him, the hallway light flickered. "'What are we looking for, exactly?' Richard asked. They stood in the center of the room, staring at their reflections. "'The lack of sleep is causing you to hallucinate,' Deborah said. There's nothing there. Why not stay at our place for a while? You can stay on the hide a bed. Get a good night's sleep, she said, and squeezed Dean's arm. He ignored her, keeping his eyes on the mirror. Willie set his comic books down and pressed his ear against the door. He could hear the muffled sounds of a conversation, but he couldn't make out the words. A prickling sensation crawled from the base of his spine and over his scalp, like little needles. The hallway light continued to flicker, and Willie felt the weight of some unknowable dread fall upon him. The back porch light surged with energy, the room bathed in bright light before plunging into darkness. Deborah yelped in surprise. The air in the room felt heavy and electric. The light outside blinked back to life. The dim yellow of the porch light barely illuminated the room. Behind them, in the mirror's reflection, the inky blackness of the wall fell away to reveal the silhouette of a man in a large, wide-brimmed hat. He had no discernible features, yet they could feel his stare on the backs of their necks. A blind, wild fear filled them with the urge to run, to escape. They turned and ran toward the door, but something caught their legs and the three fell to the ground. Dean wheezed. The weight of some unknown force pressed on his chest, squeezing the air out of his body. Next to him, Deborah and Richard fought to breathe. She kicked, but the air caught her foot and with a painful twist of her ankle, spun her around on her back. Willie heard the sound of a commotion followed by what sounded like someone inhaling deeply, like something sucked all the air out of the room, followed by a loud pop. He pressed his head hard against the door. His ear throbbed, but he couldn't hear anything. The room had gone silent. Willie slowly opened the door and peeked into the dark room. Mom? Dad? No answer. Uncle Dean? He said and stepped into the room. The back porch light barely illuminated the objects inside. No parents, no uncle, only Willie, the mirror, and a dark mass hanging from the base. Curious and unable to make out the shape in the dark, he walked closer trying to get a better look. His mother's hand hung limp from the base of the mirror. 
Willie watched the last of the fingers slip into the rippling liquid surface of the glass. He screamed and ran for the door, but a sharp pain in his shoulder spun him around to face the mirror. In the reflection, the silhouette of a man in a wide brim hat gripped Willie by the shoulder. He struggled under the shadow man, whose hold tightened. Willie whimpered in pain, red spots formed on his shirt from the sharp nails of the invisible fingers. A sudden tug and Willie was dragged forward towards the mirror, his screams cut short by the shock of his body being pulled into the icy cold of the liquid glass. His muscles spasmed and his jaw snapped shut, nearly severing his tongue. With each tug, he felt the coldness grow until it enveloped him completely. Outside, the light flickered. All right, so dig this. Like, weird shit happens in the forests of Upper Oregon, especially in that sweet spot between Mount Hood and Adams, a hot spot for every little bit of paranormal strangeness in our already strange world. People think of the state as one big extension of Portland, but the honest to goodness truth, the state is mostly forest and dense forest too. Some of the thickest you'll find. I moved away after high school, partially by choice and partly because my folks kicked me out. I spent the summer down in New Mexico fishing and living out of my van while I picked up odd jobs from nearby ranches. But by mid-September, I began to feel homesick and I figured I might as well visit the folks and spend some time amongst the trees. October is the best time to visit Oregon. The crisp air of winter hasn't set in, and the heat of September's Indian summer hasn't left yet. The result is a cold morning that bleeds into a comfortable jeans and t-shirt kind of day, ending in a freeze-your-junk-off night. The best of everything. An hour from my hometown, I made the last-minute decision for an impromptu camping trip before visiting the folks. I parked my van at the edge of a cozy little horse camp sandwiched between Wadham Lake and the edge of the Pacific Crest Trail, high enough in elevation that all the light pollution of Portland and my hometown couldn't reach you, and as dark a night sky as you could want. Perfect for stargazing. The place was a popular spot for UFO watchers because of how clear the skies could be and its picture-perfect view of Mount Adams. However, UFO watchers were summer folk, never came up here in the fall, so I had the place to myself, save for the occasional hiker. I planned a short day hike around Wadham Lake, which sat at the bottom of a small gully. I wanted to get some trout fishing in too, it's a good lake for trout. I kept my day pack permanently packed with the essentials, first aid kit, some homemade fire starter, a flashlight, and MREs. The pack required little preparation outside of whatever I felt like snacking on while at the lake. Be, be, be prepared, the motto of the Boy Scouts and all. I spent the day relaxing around my van, reading and polishing off the last of the kielbasa and beer I had in my small cooler. The morning was colder than expected. I woke up before dawn and fixed myself a quick breakfast and a thermos of coffee to nurse on throughout the day, and set out towards Wadham Lake. A small, well-maintained gravel trail connected the horse camp to Wadham Lake's parking lot. The trail snaked its way down the side of a large hill, a steep slope covered by thick ferns and blackberry bushes, and decorated by small winter waterfalls which fed into a ditch at the side of the road. In the summertime, the waterfalls dried up until the autumn rains came. Closer to November, the bigger the waterfalls became, eventually overflowing the ditch and spilling out onto the road, making it unusable for the winter. When I reached the parking lot, I noticed something had busted the wooden marker of Wadham Lake's trailhead in half. The top splintered and spread across the small parking lot which separated the two trails. Someone must have backed into it, or some drunks felt like wrecking up the place. The trail was a wreck too, Bushes ripped up and tree branches stripped of bark strewn across a dirt path. The whole scene put me on edge. Sure, it could be drunks or teenagers having fun wrecking the trails. I won't pretend my friends and I didn't do the same back in high school. There was a chance that this was the work of a bear letting folks know he'd moved in. 
I thumbed the buttoned pouch on my belt that held the pepper spray, thought back on a joke my dad used to tell me. How can you tell if you've found bear poop? It smells like pepper spray. Wadham's trail didn't get much better the longer I walked it. A small stream eroded the steepest part of the trail, carving its home along the center. The log steps held in place by railroad ties had begun to bloat and rot from their months soaking in water. I stepped carefully. A wet, punky log could easily lead to a sprained ankle, or worse, a broken one. The descent was exhausting, and the stream had grown in size, transforming the trail into a craggy, root-filled trench, which forced me to hike the trail's edge. The fishing better be good for the hell I put up with to reach the lake, I thought. Eventually, the trail flattened out, and the stream came to its final resting place in a massive puddle that formed a small pocket on the verge of overflowing. From here on, the trail became a series of switchbacks that gradually eased you down the hill and finally to a small sandy beach at the edge of the lake. A large widowmaker connected the mainland to a small island covered in thick bear grass and a shriveled lone pine tree. A divot had been crudely carved into the tree, forming a makeshift bench halfway over the water. Now, I figured this was as good a place as any, and prayed to the fishing gods that whoever carved the bench had found the sweet spot. I fixed a rooster tail on my line and cast it out into the lake, and I sat in silence, reeling my line in slowly before casting it out again. Some newts who had made their home under the log watched me as they bobbed up and down in the water before they eventually swam off in search of a new place to hide. My favorite part of fishing has always been the wait, more than the momentarily excitement of reeling in a fish. One of life's few chances to relax and be with your thoughts. Real zen type stuff. The splash of a trout echoed across the lake, and soon the occasional sound of fish jumping for low flying bugs would break the silence. Now we're cooking, I thought, reeling my line back in and casting it out. I spent the day fishing, took a nap, and generally lost track of time while I soaked in all the nature. By the time the sky turned pink, I'd caught my limit, plus two extra. No one else around. Why not, I thought. The rock barely missed my head, reflecting off the wood in a shower of splinters. My tackle box and cooler tumbled into the water behind me. I grabbed the cooler out of the lake before the top could come off and release the fish. The second rock hit the water where my hand had been, showering me in cold spray. I tumbled into the water, the cooler and tackle box under each arm, and made my way to the shore. A whistle cut across the lake, sharp enough to sting my ears despite the great distance. Stupid punk, I yelled back, still catching my breath. Thought I could make out the vague shape of a man amongst the pines, some crazy with a slingshot or something. I remember the splintered sign from the trailhead, figured this was my cue to leave. I packed my gear and headed for the trail. Darkness came quicker than I expected, and soon I had lost the trail. Some point halfway along, the stream forked. I hadn't noticed the second stream on the way down, and I was more than an hour into following the wrong stream before I realized it. My flashlight did little to penetrate the thick forest, and I knew the best thing for me to do would be to stay put until morning. It wasn't the first time I'd spent a night in the woods, and it probably wouldn't be the last. The stream ran near a small clearing with two large rocks sandwiched together, so the middle created a small cubbyhole. Fallen trees surrounded the rocks, giving me enough wood to keep a fire going through most of the night. Perfect. Within no time, I had a nice stack of wood and a healthy fire blazing away. I tucked myself into the cubbyhole. It wasn't comfortable, but it was the best you could hope for in a situation like this. I started to drift off to sleep when I heard a strange knock-knock sound echo up from deep within the woods, reverberating off the trees from the lake below. There was a pregnant pause, and the sounds came again, closer this time. A wooden, rhythmic knock-knock pushed myself into the crevice until I felt the sharp rocks through my jacket and stared into the forest, now transformed by my fire into a wall of darkness. This place was full of fallen trees and widowmakers. Maybe that's the sound one makes before it falls. Sure. Or perhaps it was something else. A big bear marking its territory. A cougar. Hill folk. 
Any number of things. I shook my head free of the thoughts. I was psyching myself out. It's nothing, I told myself. Normal woody sounds is all, like the creaks and groans of a house settling. Just normal sounds. A howl erupted from the darkness, standing the hairs on the back of my neck and arms on end. My stomach tightened, my fight-or-flight instincts kicked in, and my mind screamed run. Run and try your luck in the dark, but my body didn't move. The sensible part of my brain put my body into park. Sure, I knew my van was somewhere at the tip of the hill, but I also knew whatever made that noise sounded big, and most likely knew these woods better than I did. Here, I had my fire, my protective doorway from whatever the hell was knock-knocking and howling down by that lake. The knock-knocks returned, closer this time. Something massive moved. The bushes rustled, branches cracked, as the thing circled my campfire from the dark. I followed the sound with my eyes and strained to see beyond the firelight. The thing grunted, a deep, wet, burble sound like someone burping and saying, huh, in the same breath. I fumbled for my pepper spray, thumbing at the button on the pouch, and found it open and empty. I must have lost the pepper spray when I took my spill into the drink earlier in the day. Get out of here, I yelled. My voice cracked, sounding more like a question than a demand. The thing knocked against the trees, then the bushes parted, and a large, dark mass emerged. With one smooth movement, it stepped from the brush into the light of my fire and sat down. My body trembled with fear, and I pressed myself deep into the crevice until I felt the sharp points of the rock puncture my skin and the tingling sensation of blood droplets cooling. The thing rested on the balls of its large, flat feet, its body a hunched, shaggy mass of dark matted hair and mud, vaguely in the shape of a man. Like a Stretch Armstrong whose arms and legs had been pulled taut and had yet to return to their regular size. The thing rested its palms on the ground, its hands hairless, save for the strips of dark, wiry hairs which adorned the tops of its knuckles. Two wet, dark eyes stared at me, the glow of the fire reflecting in them. Below those eyes hung its mouth, limp lips, thick and pockmarked like an old denim jacket. The thing stunk to high heaven, the kind of stink that hits you like a punch to the gut, makes you gag with just a whiff of it. We stared at each other, those big dark eyes looking from me to the fire, and then back to me. The thing's mouth flapped silently. You could see the gears turning in its head, trying to work something out. Again, it looked at the fire, then at me, then at the fire. The gears turned, and finally, its eyes returned to me dark and intelligent. Whatever was mulling around in its brain had settled, and its decision made. We sat for what felt like an hour staring at each other. On occasion, it would glance at the fire and then back at me. We continued our staring contest, and again, it checked the fire. Its gaze returned to me, and those big, loose lips pulled back into some kind of smile. Its large, shovel-like teeth glowed wet and yellow in the dim firelight, and I realized what had happened. I forgot to feed the fire. I'd been so focused on the thing, I let the fire die. The thing reached for me. I grabbed a log from the pile and threw it on the fire. The flames returned with a shower of sparks, and the thing yelped and sat back. The smile faded, and the creature stared at me. The fire kept it at bay. The thing had waited for the fire to die out. It wouldn't make a move as long as I kept the fire going. I side-eyed the wood that laid beside me, and there wasn't much left. Sure as hell not enough to last more than a couple hours of this. I looked back to the creature who was looking at my pile of wood. The gears were at work. It grunted and bobbed its head like it understood the situation. The thing's eyes met mine, and something told me it knew I'd eventually run out. Our staring contest continued into the night. Each time the fire began to die, the thing reached for me, and each time I'd throw more wood on the fire. He'd sit back and wait and watch. Once again, the fire dimmed, and I reached for wood, but felt dirt. I'd used it all. The thing's lips peeled back, and that big sort of smile returned. I knew the jig was up. It leaned across the fire, and panic seized me. I grabbed my backpack and flung it on the fire. The fabric caught, and the flames blazed up. The thing howled, and I felt a cold wetness in my pants. 
It slapped its hands on the ground and huffed. I'll make it out of here, I thought. I'd burn the clothes on my back if I needed to. And I think the thing knew it too. We played the game for hours, and I was tired. I had nothing left but my cold, wet underwear. I had burned everything else, and this was it. As soon as the flames died, the thing would have me. The adrenaline and fear had overtaken me, wearing me out. My eyes felt heavy, and a sleepy delirium set in. I fought to shake it off, but couldn't. I'd fall asleep, then jerk awake a second later. The fire grew weaker each time I opened my eyes, and each time they closed for longer and longer periods, till my world went completely dark. The high school trail repair team found me in the morning. Two of the kids had snuck off for a recreational smoke when they stumbled upon me. I was barely conscious and suffering from hypothermia. I don't remember much except for my smoldering fire pit and the little cooler of empty fish hanging from a tree branch stripped of its bark. The crew lead, an older gentleman with a thick beard, drove me to the hospital. He wrapped me in blankets and gave me his thermos of coffee. The kids were kind enough to let me have their bag lunches. I figured they were happy to have the day off. By the time we reached the hospital, I had my wits about me again, and I told the doctor my story, but he chalked it up to paranoia and hallucinations. Weird shit happens in the forests of Upper Oregon. Strange things live deep within the woods. I still fish in Wadham Lake, but when I hear those knock-knock sounds, I know it's time to pack up and leave. The moon rode high, fat, and full. Its silvery glow illuminated the snowy mountain road. Good visibility despite the freshly fallen snow, but I was in a hurry and doing 40 in a 25, which meant I had no time to react to the wolf crossing the road. Instinctually, I slammed on the brakes, sending the car into a slide across the wet snow and in direct line with its path. We meant in an explosion of meat and metal. The car jumped. And when it came down, my head came with it, straight into the steering wheel. I woke to the exhausted wheeze of my car horn, a warbling flatline punctuated by the rhythmic clanks of my engine as it gave up the ghost. The world swam, a dreamy kaleidoscope of reds that slowly came into focus, revealing the car's window, a spiderweb of glass and blood. I carefully touched the tender spot at the base of my nose. The skin felt puffy and warm, buzzing with an electric numbness. My body felt stiff, the muscles still tense from the anticipation of the impact. I tried my door, but it, it wouldn't open. The panel had buckled, pinching the hinges shut, so I crawled over the various presents I bought for my family's Christmas Eve get-together and exited through the back passenger side door. I stood on the side of the mountain road and looked at my handiwork. The Taurus sat high on a snowdrift. The hood folded back on itself and the car's guts cooling as long wisps of steam dissolving into the cold night air. Totaled. No way I was driving this thing out of here, I thought, running my hand through my hair. The impact with the animal had popped my trunk open, littering the road with my emergency kit and the camping gear I'd been too lazy to unpack. I pulled my peacoat tight to keep out the cold and walked the road to where the wolf had been. Bits of the bumper and a splash of dark red mixed with paw prints leading back to the tree line where the wolf had emerged. Poor thing, I thought, worried it was suffering somewhere. Heading back to the car, I decided to gather what gifts I could carry and walk the road. I figured I was maybe an hour or two walk from the main road and a more reliable source for traffic. With any luck, I'd catch a ride to the family get-together and be back with some help and a truck we could hitch to my car. My arms filled with the few gifts whose wrapping still looked presentable. I turned to close the door with my foot when I saw the massive wolf in the center of the road. Its yellow eyes stared at me with a calm rage. The shoulders and chest matted and wet, soaked in blood, the cold glow of the moon reflected in the liquid. The wolf stood up on its hind legs with a low whine in one smooth movement, revealing its hand-like paws. 
The beast rose to its full height, and the sound grew in pitch, crescendoing into a scream, and the wolf charged, stooping down onto all fours, its hands throwing trails of powder behind it. I dropped my gifts and jumped into the back seat of the Taurus. The door closed behind me. The wolf's body slammed against the car, and the door buckled. A surge of snow covered the seats. It threw its body against the car again, pushing it deeper into the snowbank. Its black lips pulled back in a snarl. Long yellow teeth glowed in the moonlight, nostrils flared in audible gusts that fogged the window. The wolf grabbed the car handle with its malformed hand and pulled the door from the hinges with one good tug. The door sailed through the sky, landing on a puff of snow behind the beast. I crawled between the front seats as it struggled to pull itself inside. The wolf turned in the back seat, its awkward body fumbling in the tight quarters. One large paw reached for me as I exited the car through the passenger side door, catching the back of my calf, the long claws digging into my muscle, and I screamed in pain. I pulled free of the beast, falling face first into the snow. A howl of rage and the car shook as it fought to turn around and exit the door it had just come in. I pulled myself up and ran past the wolf and the vehicle, towards the camping gear spread across the road and towards my hatchet. Behind me, the wolf freed itself from the car and crawled over the hood with a frustrated roar. It leapt, landing on the ground. Billows of snow puffed into the air, coating its fur in a fine powder. The beast shook itself and shambled towards me. I grabbed the hatchet and swung just in time to bury the blade into the collarbone. The wolf screamed, its arms closing around me, and we fell forward. We hit the ground and the wolf let go, rolling onto its back, its misshapen hands fumbling for the hatchet handle. I got to my feet and tried to run, but the wolf grabbed me and pulled me down again. I clawed at the ground, pulling myself away from the wolf as it freed the hatchet from its collarbone. The wolf pulled me backward and my hand caught on something cold, thin, and metal. One of my tent spikes. I gripped the spike, rolled onto my back, and with all my strength I sat up and stabbed the rod downwards. The golden eye of the wolf disappeared in an instant. The beast released my leg and grabbed its empty socket with a howl of pain. I stood up and ran towards the emergency kit and the flare lane beside it. The wolf whimpered, pawing delicately at the spot its eye used to be, and with a snarl it stood up on its hind legs. Great exhaustive breath sprayed foam and froth, and the wolf stalked towards me, its muscles tensed, the malformed hands opening and closing on empty air. I wiped the snow from the flare, popped the head and took a deep breath, then struck the starter. A burst of neon red and a loud sizzle filled the air. The wolf stopped. It studied the flare for a moment before it lunged. The force of its body knocked the wind from my lungs and the rod from my hand. We fell backward, the wolf's mouth closing around my arm, its large head shaking back and forth, ripping through my muscles and severing tendons. I blindly groped for the flare with my free hand, clawing at the snow until I felt the sting of hot sparks. My hand landing on the body of the rod, I shoved the burning head into the wolf's mouth, forcing it past the teeth and into its throat. The shower of sparks burned through the arm of the peacoat trapped in the wolf's mouth, singeing my skin. I pushed the flare further in, the wolf fighting against me, squealing in pain. It broke away, stumbling on all fours heading towards the trees. Hot burst of neon sprayed from within its mouth. The beast crawled to the edge of the road, gasping and whimpering until it collapsed. The adrenaline faded and I fell backward into the snow. My body ached, the sharp stabbing pain of my wounds replaced by a dull throb. My brain slow and groggy, as if in the grips of a bad hangover. I lay on the road, puffs of breath drifting upwards as I watched the snowflakes silently fall in slow, lazy arcs landing on my face. My blood pooled around me, Soaking into the snow, thin wisps of steam as the two mixed, melting into each other. 
Above me, silvery moonlight shone through the trees, and I felt a strange comfort in its cold glow. The old Maynard house sat atop the hill at the end of our cul-de-sac like a swollen pimple. An off-white terracotta roof capped the dirty red brick of the old house. A chain fence circled the base of the infection and hung loosely from bent metal poles, entwined in thick patches of dead weeds which covered the property. The adults in the cul-de-sac hated the place. The house was about as old as the street, built years before I was born, and had remained empty. According to them, the lot was worth more than the house itself. The kids did everything they could to avoid the Maynard house. Pets in our neighborhood would go missing. Rumors of hobos sneaking into the house only to disappear, leaving nothing but their tattered clothes behind. Kids said the place was evil, that it ate people. They said it had a curse on it, that the original owner still haunts the home, and anyone who goes in is doomed to join him in the afterlife. Which sounds like late night horror movie mumbo jumbo to me. Ghost stories don't scare me, and the Maynard house didn't bother me much either. I didn't have time for imaginary fears, on account of one real fear, and that was Jeremy Dietz. Jeremy was the resident bully, my bully in particular, a seventh grader so big you'd easily mistake for a sophomore in high school. Jeremy had it all, a bad attitude and worse hygiene. Everything about him looked oily, his skin, hair, and clothes all had a dirty sheen to them like he'd grown up sleeping in the back of a Piggly Wiggly's. Jeremy had one friend, his loyal yes man and personal goon, Andy Teagan, the gangly, awkward kid with a bad case of acne above his lip, which he attempted to hide with a wispy mustache that reminded me of catfish whiskers. The two bonded over their mutual hatred of me, and that morning I figured they were feeling pretty close with each other. After gym, Jeremy and Andy cornered me by the wooden soccer goal. Hey, doughboy, how about an interview? Jeremy held his hand up to my face like a reporter with a microphone. Hold on, Jer, he won't fit the camera, Andy said holding up his hands, making a rectangle with his pointer fingers and thumbs, then pulled them apart, zooming the camera out. He still won't fit, and he pulled them even farther apart. What's it like being so fat? Jeremy asked. I kept my head down and didn't respond. I learned early on if I stared at my feet and didn't look them in the eyes, they'd get bored and leave, but usually not before a punch to the kidney or a slap to my belly. My dad hated this. He'd seen me do it a couple of times outside our house before he'd half-heartedly run the two off. You gotta learn to stand up for yourself, he'd say. Guys like that'll push you around all your life if you let them. You gotta push back. Oh, come on, fat, Jeremy said, and slapped my stomach for emphasis. It stunk. You know Andy and me are only kidding. We figured we'd been too mean to you, so we thought we'd give you a chance to hang out with us. Be one of the cool kids. Really? Sure. You just have to do one little thing to prove you'll be a good friend. I threw my favorite baseball through the window of the old Maynard house last night. I need you to go get it. After school, shepherded by my bullies, I climbed the Maynard house's chain link fence. I reached the top and attempted to vault over, but my stomach caught the sharp edge of the chain link, scratching me through my shirt, and I rolled over instead, falling onto the other side. My pants caught on a piece of loose chain, ripping the back. Behind me, Jeremy and Andy laughed from the sidewalk. I stood at the base of the walkway with my seat blown out and my whitey tidy showing. The house looked much more menacing without a chain link fence between me and Ed. All those stories of missing pets and dead hobos suddenly seemed all too real. Nothing like facing potential death with a hole in your pants. I took a deep breath and walked up the shield path to the house. The door opened easier than I expected, given its age. The dusty windows along the side of the house did little to illuminate the interior. I stepped from the foyer into the combination living room and kitchen. The broken glass of the kitchen window where Jeremy's baseball had entered glittered on the countertop, sparkling in the orange light of the setting desert sun, but I saw no sign of the ball. The living room was empty of furniture and narrowed into a short hallway with two doors framed on either side of an open nook. A large iron grate filled the cavity's floor, and there sat the baseball cradled between the two middle bars. A growing unease bubbled up from deep in the pits of my stomach the closer I came to the grate. Whatever the feeling was, it was enough to make me consider leaving without the baseball and accept the beating that waited for me if I returned empty-handed. Ghosts and goblins aren't real, but Jeremy's fists are. I took a deep breath, then reached over the grate. A chattering echoed from within the grate, and a tiny clawed hand popped out from between the bars and made a grab for my sleeve, but came up short and disappeared back into the grate. 
I yanked my arm back, stumbling backward, falling onto my butt. Claws scrambling across metal echoed from within the vent, and the tiny hand popped out again, swinging blindly in the air before it disappeared. Whatever was down there screeched and chattered and sounded like overall, it was in a bad mood. From what I could tell, whatever it was couldn't climb out of the vent, and as long as I stayed clear of the grate, it couldn't reach me. I looked inside. Towards the bottom, peeking out from a bend in the pipe, were two golden eyes, like giant orbs centered in a furry body, which reminded me of a blot of ink. It chittered at me and clicked its teeth together. I took it for some sort of raccoon given its hands had five fingers, but as far as I knew, raccoon hands didn't end in long claws, and their arms didn't have scales. The thing paced in a circle, and then in a sudden burst of speed, it scrambled up the pipe just short of the top and slid back down. Well, this answered where all the pets had disappeared to. Uh, poor thing, who knows how long it's been since it's eaten anything. I wasn't keen on the fact it was eating the local pet population, but I didn't like to see an animal suffer. We stared at each other for a moment, those giant golden orbs looking at me, like a puppy. And with the toe of my shoe, I lifted the grate, flipping it backward on its hinges. What are you doing back there, fat? Jeremy stepped into the foyer. Behind him, Andy cautiously followed. I found something. Come look. Some sort of animal. I think it's trapped. No way, Jeremy said, and the two ran into the hallway, pushing me aside and leaning over the grate. I think I see it, Andy said. Let me see. Jeremy shoved him out of the way. What is it? Some kind of dog? Andy said. Doesn't look nothing like a dog. Jeremy thought for a moment. Let's get our BB guns. My dad's words came to me. You gotta push back. And before Jeremy could turn around, I shoved him. He toppled in the vent with a scream, stopping partway, his legs sticking out of the hole, kicking wildly in the air. There came the scrambling of claws on metal and a loud, wet crunch. The screaming stopped, replaced by a gurgle. Jeremy's legs jerked a couple of times before they disappeared in the vent, leaving us with the sound of lips smacking, punctuated by chitters of contentment as whatever it is ate. Andy and I looked at each other, both of us stunned by what had just happened, him by what I had done, and me by the realization of how good it felt. He tried to push past me, but I weighed more, and I shoved him back with all that extra weight behind it, the weight they used to make fun of me over. Andy fell on his back, his head hanging over the vent. There was scrambling, and those little hands popped up and wrapped their tiny claws around his face and pulled him inside. I listened to the thing in the vent happily chewing away. I reached over and closed the grate, the thing's giant golden eyes fixed on me. I smiled. I still had a couple of folks I wanted my new pet to meet. The summer was uncommonly hot for early June in the Pacific Northwest. A muggy heat settled into the gorge, an impressive dampness you couldn't escape. With the heat came the clouds, thin wisps that grew into a gray bank that deepened in color as June turned into July. For our little orchard town, full of hard-working folks struggling to get by, all religious and superstitious, they saw it as a sign the devil had worked his mojo on the land. People died from heat exhaustion, but most were folk who shouldn't have been out in the heat to begin with. The elderly, mostly. Still, that didn't stop people from talking, convinced the clouds held promises of bad things to come. I leaned against the baluster of our small church. The wooden planks beneath me creaked as I shifted my weight. What a way to spend 4th of July, I thought, exhausted from clearing the weeds around the headstones of our mountainside cemetery. My punishment for accidentally defacing one of them with a box of fireworks, leaving a blackened pile of rocks to mark the grave's location. The pastor had caught me in the act, confiscating my box and calling my parents. The old tattletale. Already you're calling it quits, said Walter, walking up from the tool shed. I don't blame you. This heat is something else. You know five people died this week? He pulled a handkerchief from the breast pocket of his overalls and dabbed his forehead. Walter was the groundskeeper, a bald man whose skin hung like loose aged denim. Lord knows why Pastor Jackson saw fit to have you working in this heat. He pocketed his handkerchief. Why don't I grab us both a cola from the fridge? I always stock a six pack for the weekends, he said, slapping me on the back before heading into the church. A soda sounded good, but he was gone before I thought to request water. I waited on Walter, eager for that drink. I thought to get up and meet him inside, but I didn't feel like moving. So I sat and let my eyes wander eventually drifting up to the sky. 
The clouds had a strange purple sheen to them. I watched the color move in rhythmic, pulsing waves like an ocean tide, and soon the tap, tap of water on the roof casually built to the steady drum of a warm summer storm. The rain fell heavy on the cemetery, bathing it in its eerie purple glow. The porch slats behind me groaned. What in God's good grace? Walter said. He rushed to the edge of the porch, shocked by the swirls of color that danced across the sky, lit by purple luminescence. The rain carried the color in electric droplets of neon that coated the headstones and seeped into the earth. We looked from the cemetery to each other, unsure of what to do, but frozen in place. It wasn't until Walter eyed movement that he broke the silence. Pointing to the nearest tombstone, he said, Look! Then to another one. There too. And there. The earth rose like a molehill, clumps of wet grass pushed aside by the dirt beneath, as if something was making its way to the surface. The top of the mound parted, and a thick, flesh-colored jelly poured over the sides. The ooze crawled across the ground to join the other human jellies, until it formed a pile of shifting skin tones and facial features. Human eyes drifted across the body, looking around in short, quick movement. More blobs of congealed flesh pulled themselves from their graves to crawl across rows of headstones and join the growing mass. Walt, that thing's alive, I said. No shit, kid. Pardon my French. He took a step back. The wooden plank protested and groaned under his weight. The eyes looked in his direction and he froze. They drifted up and down, regarding him curiously. Walter's eyes connected with mine, a sad, pleading look on his face. He knew he'd been caught. A sinewy tendril of thick, purple meat erupted from the mass, smashing into Walter's head. His neck snapped with a pop. The tendril pulled taut and yanked him forward. Stubby, fat hands gripped Walter's body and pulled him off the steps and into the flesh. He spasmed, sinking into the ooze. A wave of reddening foam bubbled around him, absorbing Walter into the heap of rotten flesh. My feet moved before I realized what was happening. Fight or flight kicked in and I flew to the door. Behind me, I could hear the ooze digesting Walter. His body popped and fizzed, the sound of bacon cooking in too much grease. The ooze scrambled onto the porch. Stubby fingers pulled it forward. Walter's face had joined the others, floating across the thing's body, frozen in terror. My hands fumbled with the door locks, latching them in time to feel the wood shudder from the force of the blob on the other side. Ooze surged underneath the door, puddling around my feet. My shoes foamed at the acid touch. Kicking the stuff away, I left the door for the pastor's office. Figuring if I could get out of its line of sight, the ooze couldn't find me. Pushing open the door, I discovered the good pastor had left me a gift. My box of fireworks sat in the middle of his desk. The ooze reformed in the middle of the entranceway and started its search. Eyes looked for me in all directions. Mouths opened and closed like a fish gasping for air. I waited. Peeking out from behind the cracked office door, my bick in one hand and a Roman candle in the other. The box of fireworks at my feet. No idea if this would work, but most things don't like burning. And if I were going to be dissolved by a fleshy ooze monster, I prefer to be going down in a blaze of glory. I pictured the scenario in my mind. Action movie cool. I flung the door open and kicked the box into the entranceway, fireballs flying from the Roman candles. I'd probably say something witty. That is not how it happened. I swung the door too hard and it swung back just as I had kicked my box of fireworks into the entranceway, separating me from my ammunition. I swore silently, and then I excused myself. This was a house of God, after all. It didn't take long to pour into the office underneath the door. Putting my back to the wall and the pastor's desk between us, I lit the Roman candle, 
A bright pop of white light and a barrage of whistling fireballs skittered across the oozes of flesh, showering the room in sparks. Papers and books caught fire, and the room walls went up in flames. The ooze escaped from underneath the door, and I followed. Flinging open the door, a fresh burst of air gave life to the fire. Flames and smoke crawled into the entranceway behind us, alerting the fire alarms. Fireballs streaked from the fresh Roman candle I pulled from the box in my pursuit, catching on the nostril of some poor soul's face. The flame took hold, traveling across its body like an oil fire. Stubby fingers carried the ooze towards the main doors, but another barrage of fireballs connected with the burning flesh, and the thing collapsed. A blackening mass writhed beneath the flames, popping and sizzling as the fire fed on grease and fat. I exited the church, now completely engulfed in flames, the heat and smoke swirling up into the cloud layer. The rain fell, devoid of the eerie purple glow. I sat on the grass, my arms resting on my knees, hot and exhausted. Every breath hurt. My throat burned from smoke inhalation. I watched the church burn and thought of Walter. And with a strained cough, wish I had that soda. Blair Erkin and I popped a couple Reese's pieces and looked out the window of our school. Above us, the heater worked overtime, buzzing and rattling like a bunch of screws inside a washing machine trying to combat the icy air that leaked in through the windows. I zipped my coat and shoved a few more candies in my mouth. I was shivering more from excitement than from the cold. Tonight, we would catch a ghost. Before it became a school, whatever this building was, it required a dumbwaiter for folks to do their business. A large wooden box with rope running through it connected to a pulley. According to local legend, some unlucky kid tried to ride the thing during a game of hide-and-seek, and it got stuck between the floors. The whole town searched for him, but nobody checked the dumbwaiter until the smell seeped through the walls and the kids and teachers complained. He must have struggled until his last breath, because when they removed his body, He'd ripped his fingernails off from clawing the inside of the box. Now they say he still haunts it. Can't move on from his final resting place until he finishes the game. Blair believed the story, but I was skeptical since I heard the tale from Elliot Lloyd, who also says wrestling is real. It would scare most kids to meet a ghost, but not Blair. He was a bona fide believer in the stuff. He ate, breathed, and slept them. Mr. Gwynn should be done soon. He checked the time on his phone. He'd been stalking around the school for weeks now, learning everyone's schedules in preparation like a thief cases out a place before they rob it. He kept a journal of the haunted places in our town with detailed notes on each. So, what's the plan once he leaves? What are we going to do to catch this ghost? I popped a few more Reese's into my mouth. He beamed, hoping I'd ask. He pulled a notebook from his backpack. Paper stuck out from the sides. Ripped strips of neon post-its covered in chicken scratch marked the important sections. He laid the book on the nearest table and opened the page topped by a bright green strip. The pages were a scrapbook of old newspaper clippings and the manic writings of an excited kid whose brain ran faster than his hand could write. So, Casey Bell, the boy who died, will only appear if you follow certain rules. Who told you them, I asked. Elliot Lloyd. Why? Of course he did. He said aliens gave his dog cancer, too. He looked confused. You think he'd lie? I'm just saying I'd prefer a better source. But we're here, so continue. Okay, so he won't come unless we follow the rules, right? Sure. I'll ride the dumb waiter from the first floor to the third, where you'll be there to meet me. Once I arrive, say, I found you. And you're it. And then he'll show up. What happens then? I asked. He shrugged. No idea. Outside the room, Mr. Gwynn whistled an off-tune rendition of Hanky Panky by the Shondells while he did his final rounds in the main hall, ending with the slamming of the school's big metal doors. And with the click of the door lock, we were alone in the school. Me, Blair, and Casey. A pair of staircases capped the first floor hallway. Walking down those stairs was like stepping into a secret underground bunker. 
A singular red light reflected off the lockers and the large pipes that ran the length of the ceiling. Their gaseous whispers replaced the clunking and rattling of the heaters. And in the dark, surrounded by the sound, I believed Elliot Lloyd, who said snakes could roll downhill by biting their tails, might be right about the ghost boy. They built the dumbwaiter into the side of the student's store, a concession stand where kids could buy candy, soda pop, and supplies before and after school started. At some point in the building's history, folks must have sent stuff here from the upper floors of the building. Blair pried loose the boards, barring the shaft with little effort, which made me wonder why nobody had attempted to ride it before us. That doesn't look safe, I said. A couple of wood panels were cracked and splintered, others missing, leaving gaps that could fit an arm or a leg. Two frayed ropes as thick as the ones you'd climb in gym ran through the center. He ignored me, cleared the dumbwaiter's cobwebs, then took off his backpack. I'm gonna need a boost. I linked my fingers and he stepped onto my hands and I lifted him onto the box. The thing shuddered under his weight, making little popping and snapping sounds as he shifted himself into a comfortable position behind the ropes. He tugged one of them and the dumbwaiter dropped a few inches. The wooden slats groaned and he flashed me a nervous smile. You remember the rules? He asked. Yeah, I said. He gave the rope a good yank. The box lurched upwards and he was on his way. I reached the third floor before him. The boards blocking the shaft were harder to pry off, but I removed them before the dumbwaiter appeared. When it arrived, he was still smiling. Okay, now the words. I hesitated. Nervous. Excited. You sure? Yes. All right. I found you, Casey. And you're it. We waited. The minutes ticked by, and Blair's smile turned into a frown. His lips trembled, fighting the urge to cry. The notebook he devoted hours of study to held against his chest. Nothing's gonna happen, is it? He asked. I don't think so. Poor guy built his expectations so high that he didn't consider the possibility that ghosts weren't real. I felt guilty for going along with it. But I wasn't about to shoulder the guilt alone. Elliot Lloyd deserved a punch in the kidney tomorrow for filling his head with junk. Then the room became cold. At the back of the dumbwaiter sat a boy, arms and legs folded over his body, brows furrowed, glassy, bloodshot eyes bulged from his wet socket, his mouth stretched open, gasping for air. Casey had arrived. What's wrong? Blair asked. Pale blue hands missing their fingernails gripped the sides of his face. The raw red tips dug into his cheeks. The ghost leaned forward. Now you're it. And with a violent jerk, the dumbwaiter fell. And they were gone. Bruce Springsteen blared through the truck speakers, and I lost track of how many times Glory Days played. I stopped counting around five. I wasn't a fan of the song, but that's the price you paid for riding with Gavin. He could only play the boss. The tape was stuck in the tape deck, so you soldiered on until you reached your destination. I enjoyed his company less than his taste in music. But I had run out of fishing buddies months ago, and I never fished alone. He turned down the radio. Hell of a drive. This play's worth it. You've seen the fish I brought home? Yeah, I seen him. I grabbed a moon pie from the bag between my feet and offered it to him. He patted his belly and said the missus put him on a diet. I didn't blame her. The base of his gut rode so far past his thighs it pressed against the steering wheel. See, a back injury in a steady check from workers' comp increased his bank account, which expanded his beer funds and stomach. Not that he still wasn't a tough-looking SOB. 
He'd been our star quarterback and captain of the wrestling team back in high school, and he still carried that muscle on him. Gavin leaned back, adjusted himself, and ripped a big one. You could hear the grease. They pay me no rent, I kick them out, he said, fanning his face. I rolled down my window. Your daddy still handling them snakes? He asked. Down at the church? Yeah, and he's still preaching. Ain't just snakes, though. He's got all kinds of reptiles. Damn fool thing swinging round cotton mouths like that. Lord works in mysterious ways. Guess so. Turn here. Gavin pulled onto the narrow dirt trail, almost invisible from the road. Hidden between the shadows of the scrub brush and pine trees, bare branches dragged across the sides of his truck, scratching what little of the lime green paint remained. You sure picked a lake at the ass end of nowhere, he said and reached for a moon pie. The diet must have slipped his mind. You still got that alligator? Yeah, he's around. Must be pretty big, he said, shoving as much moon pie as possible into his mouth. About 25 feet? 25 feet? You shitting me? He whistled. The hell you feed that thing? I shrugged and said, Nah, he ain't picky. He'll eat whatever the congregation brings him. That's so? Damn gator probably eating better than me. He part of this church too? He shoved the rest of the moon pie into his mouth, crumpled up the wrapper and chucked it out the window. Yeah, he's kind of like an avatar. An avatar? What's that? A god. Manifested on Earth. You mean like Jesus? I guess. He reached behind the seat and came back with a diet soda. Couldn't leave me a single beer, could she? He said, looking at the soda pop like he had a handful of shit. This is Avatar. God. Whatever got a name. Blackjack. Blackjack? That's your god's name. He popped the tab and took a swig. Sounds a little modern. And belched for emphasis. I suppose they said the same thing about Jesus. He worked his jaw side to side, like I had posed a deep philosophical question. I suppose so. The dirt road opened into a turnaround at the end of a ridge surrounded by a pile of gravel and river rock big enough to obscure the lake from view. Once he parked, we stretched, relieved ourselves, and grabbed the gear from the truck bed. Two taillight panels propped up on hills of gravel marked the entrance to the lake. Gavin, already sweating, waddled behind me as we descended the hill. <sighs> you didn't say nothing about a hike. <sighs> My couple of switchbacks and we'll be at the lake. I said and quickened my pace, figuring he needed the exercise. We pushed through thick underbrush towards the sound of fallen water that led to the lake. My bowl of volcanic rock kept full by multiple waterfalls. Widowmakers lined the bottom, obscured by floating mats of peat moss. See that? Hangs over the deepest point. The biggest trout are there, I said pointing to a slab of flat rock jutting over the water. We climbed over the logs that littered the bank, careful not to slip on their mossy tops. How's your back? I asked, looking over my shoulder at Gavin, who'd been huffing and grunting. <sighs> Fine. Why? Just checking, I said, easing out onto the rock. He grunted in response, being a considerate host, I let him take the prime spot on the lip. I ain't no snapping turtles, he asked. I shook my head. He popped his shoes off and dipped his feet in the water. You know, I never took you for a fisherman. 
He fixed his hook with salmon eggs and cast his line to the edge of the peat moss. I picked it up out of habit. An hour passed with no sign of fish, and he was getting impatient. You sure you didn't fish this place clean? They're here. Fishing is a game of patience. Didn't you know that? I'm aware. Just saying a man's patience has limits. Well, I'm sure you haven't hit yours yet. We watched the logs bob and drift in the pond's current, and I guess this must have got him to thinking. Where would you keep a 25-foot gator? Around, I said. You keep saying that, but... The closest log exploded from the water, massive jaws closed around his waist, squeezing air and old moon pie out of his mouth. Blackjack pulled him from the rock with a splash of his tail and a jerk of his head. The two struggled, Blackjack chomping and spinning and Gavin cursing and calling for help, all while trying to pry those jaws loose. I sat on the rock, my stomach in my throat. God or not, feeding people to a hungry gator always made me feel guilty. He was so big, a good spin would rip apart most folks. They didn't suffer. But if that didn't work, he'd hold the survivor underwater till they drowned. I hated that. The big gator snapped his jaws trying to get a good grip. After a couple of tries, he let go and retreated underwater. Gavin grabbed the rock trying to pull himself up, but he'd lost too much blood. His lips pulled tight and nostrils flared, breathing in quick short bursts. He was dying. The massive gator resurfaced underneath him, lifting him high into the air, snapping its mouth closed, splitting Gavin from shoulder to groin, and baptizing me in a spray of blood. So much for this outfit. Blood is a bitch to clean. The gator gulped his food down with a jerk of its head, then he submerged and was gone. I fixed some salmon eggs on my hook and cast my line into the lake. Soon the water was alive with trout, the biggest you'd ever seen. Jumping and swimming beneath the rock, I dangled my feet in the cool water and watched the fish circle my legs. Nibbling at the bits of floating meat, Blackjack left. The Lord provides... I woke up this morning, the same as every morning, except my hands weren't mine. They looked like mine, but they weren't mine. They felt different. I don't know how to explain it. They could talk, not like normal speech, but brain speech. You know how uh, people on talk shows do, the ones who read minds? Telepathy. They spoke telepathically to each other. And I guess because they were my hands, I, I picked up on their brain waves. I'm no scientist, just speculating. They didn't speak English or any ordinary language either. They talked like, uh, like a couple of Muppets, all bleep, bleep, blorp, blorp. I understood them though. Don't ask me how, I, I couldn't tell you, but it was like their bleeping and blopping passed through this filter in my mind and I translated it. Like I said, I'm no scientist. I tried speaking to them, but they ignored me, which seemed rude. If you hijack somebody's body parts, the least you could do is say howdy or thank you. But I didn't complain. Lord knows I'm used to it, the way my husband acts. <laughs> so, I went about my day and listened to their conversations. At first, it was everyday things, water cooler talk. How's the wife and kids? You catch the game last night. But around 10 that morning, they started talking business. They aimed to invade the earth, targeting housewives who are sick and tired of their husband's shenanigans, making those wives kill their spouses, then out the herd, make it harder for the species to repopulate. Takes two to tango. Now, I've got this theory. After listening to their discussions all day, I concluded they were aliens. Or ghost of aliens. Ghostlians? I'm fuzzy on the specifics. There wasn't much I could do to stop the invasion, with my mitts controlled by the enemies, except warn my husband. So, 
While he ate dinner, I told him everything, down to the last detail. I mean everything, how my hands weren't mine, that aliens or ghost aliens possessed them, that they had families, watched sports, and planned to take over the Earth. He turned around, a mouthful of meatloaf, and stared at me like I'd gone crazy. Can you believe that? I tried to save the man's life, and he acts like I'm Looney Tunes? Realizing I spilled the beans on their plans, my hands grabbed a knife and stuck it into his chest. He made an oof sound and then dropped, dead, onto his meatloaf. Spraying mashed potatoes and gravy across the kitchen, of course he'd go out, leaving me a mess to clean. The deed was done. Their mission accomplished. My hands started shimmering and beam shot up into the ceiling and then vanished. You ever seen Star Trek? Like when they travel from planet to spaceship, it looked like that. After they beamed up, that's what they call it on Star Trek, I felt like my hands were mine. So, what do you think? You believe me, right? A pair of sneakers hung from the power line, and Edgar wished they were his. He'd been shoeless and living out of a trash can for a week now, and he was due for a fresh pair. He thought they'd feel awfully good on his calloused feet, might ease the pain of that ingrown toenail that had been bugging him too. Rock in hand, he was fixing to knock them down when they dropped to the ground on their own. Well, Christ in a cracker, he thought. About time the good Lord saw fit to bless this sinner with some luck. He put them on and went for a walk. They fit like a glove. Just about the most comfortable shoes you'd find. They would work his feet over. Soft, warm, and with each step, giving the best foot massage of his life, pressing and squeezing in just the right spots. Even his toenails stopped hurting. Oh, it was feeling good. Maybe he'd swing by the dumpster out back of Lancers and show the fellas his new pumps. Might even try to score a free beer. He'd been walking for a while when he noticed that the shoes felt tighter. He was sure of it. Hot, too. He thought they might probably just need to be broken in. But the shoes grew even tighter. And the massage turned rough, squishing and squeezing his toes until it became downright painful, each step worse than the last. Edgar tried to untie the shoes, but couldn't undo the laces. He tugged the shoestrings, and the strings tugged back. He tried again, but the shoelaces slapped his hand away. So he boxed the toe of the shoe, and they growled. The collars pulled back, and a pair of long, hollow fangs flicked forward. Edward screamed, and the shoes struck Pelly barbs dug into his skin, opening his Achilles tendons, and they drank, sucking the blood from his veins. He pulled on the shoes and kicked in the air, but they held on. He didn't know what to do. So he ran, and the blood pumped. The sneaks kept slurping and sucking until he fell into the ground, dead. Dead. They pulled themselves off his feet, smacked their lips, and burped. They yawned, stretched their laces, and crawled up to the closest telephone pole and out onto the wire to hang for a nap. 
Late that night, just around dinner time, Billy Lee came wobbling along, his belly full of beer, his skull full of stupid that comes from being drunk. He almost stumbled over Edgar's body. The hell are you doing laying on the road, Edgar? Edgar didn't respond. He was still dead. He lived three tents down from Edgar, figuring it was the neighborly thing to do, dragged him on the sidewalk and then shook his head and clicked his tongue. Learn to handle your liquor, Ed. Satisfied, he moseyed on, enjoying his drunk, when a pair of sneakers landed in front of him. <laughs> They looked new. Well, this must be his lucky day. He slid on the shoes and two-stepped down the street. Strangest thing, they felt tighter than a minute ago. <laughs> Charlie was a weirdo the terror of Dog River Middle School, and a grade A creep. His classmates nicknamed him Gnarly Charlie. He was short and round with a freckled pit bull face and a bite me baseball cap. They kept his mop of oily red hair in check. A perpetual shit. He'd pick his nose and wipe boogers on anyone he could outrun and scratched his ass so much that teachers made him wash his hands twice as long as the other kids. If he used the computer, the librarian sprayed the keyboard with disinfectant, swearing you could see dirt on the keys. Gnarly Charlie's foul disposition and hygiene issues kept kids and teachers at a distance. He didn't have many friends. He'd throw rocks at horses and chase cats and dogs with sticks, but insects were his favorite, collecting them in his plastic jar during lunch. They're for science. I'm an entomologist, someone who studies bugs. And he'd pull out his container of pinned insects. Below each one, he'd written names that referenced sex acts, swear words, or teachers and classmates, sometimes all at once. Insect collectors freeze their bugs for a week or two before pinning them to a board, but not Charlie. He pinned them fresh. He also pulled their legs off. It was his favorite part, especially if the bug could fly. They'd buzz around his desk, bouncing like jumping beans. He loved it. A teacher once asked him, how would you like it if someone ripped your arms and legs off? They're bugs, who cares? He said, plucking the legs from a beetle he found. On a Friday night in late June, the weatherman announced a meteor shower. This is the big one, folks, once in a lifetime. It'll put the Perseids to shame. It was all anyone could talk about, except for Charlie. He couldn't give two shits. There was a knock at his door. His parents stepped in and exchanged concerned looks. Their son lay on the floor holding a spider by its legs with a pair of tweezers, library books on arachnids spread in front of him. Hey kiddo, your mom and I are going to a meteor viewing party. How about you join us? No thanks. He stretched two of the spider's legs, the others curling and uncurling until, pop, one leg came off. His dad winced. Charlie stretched another leg, pop, I know you're interested in bugs, but don't torture the poor things. How would you like it if someone pulled your legs off? Okay, he said, ignoring his dad. Pop! His parents shook their heads, unsure of what to do about their child's obsession with de-legging any insect he found. Don't be up too late, kiddo. Okay. Pop! And they left. By the time the meteor shower started, Charlie was pinning his pile of insects to a board. He kicked his legs in the air, thinking of all the crude names he'd write when his bedroom lights flickered. A low rumble. 
like a plane taking off, shook the house. Books fell from the shelves and boards of pinned legless insects dropped off the wall, shattering on the ground. A pulsing light of purple and blue entered through the window, filling the room. Charlie watched the meteor fly over his house and into the woods and crash. Forgetting his bugs, he grabbed a flashlight, slipped on a pair of flip-flops, and ran out his back door towards the forest. Now he was interested in the meteor shower. A meteor, a real life meteor right here in my backyard. He pushed his way through the undergrowth, following the trail of smoke from the crash site. Still a speck of purple and blue light in the distance. The smell of burnt vegetation stung his nose. He went deeper into the forest and the trees grew thicker. Pine needles scratched his hands and face as he forced his way through the tree boughs. The scent grew stronger, the light bigger, and a low, rhythmic hum filled the forest and drowned all other sounds out. He squeezed through the last row of trees, whose sparse black branches reminded him more of thick hair than the boughs of a tree, and stepped onto the crash site. Instead of a meteor, a massive disk sat atop uprooted trees. The humming engine burned the ground beneath the craft black. Colors pulsed across the edge of the disk. A trail of dotted lights fed towards the bubbled canopy which topped the craft. A sense of dread replaced curiosity. This was a UFO. He'd seen them in movies and books. UFOs meant aliens. And aliens were rarely nice to humans on TV. The trees surrounding Charlie uprooted themselves and stepped towards him. One swung forward, snatching him with three thick roots that squeezed his body. The tree raised him high into the air. These weren't trees, but legs. Strange. Charlie saw himself reflected in the night sky but it wasn't the sky. He was looking into a large black eye. The reflective eye sat nestled in the center of a hard, carapaced head. Five smaller eyes blinked and swiveled in pockets of spongy skin, surrounding the larger eye in a horseshoe pattern. The creature turned him over, examining him. Its pedipalps rubbed together with a curious, hmm. Despite their size, the fingers were nimble. They poked and prodded him, flipping him from one hand to the other. Satisfied, the alien gripped Charlie about the waist. With the other hand, it held his wrist and raised his arm. Hot pain engulfed his shoulder and traveled through his chest. His ears filled with the sound of flesh being torn. A sudden pop and his arm was gone. The alien held the limb to its face. Its smaller eyes twitched and blinked inside their fleshy pockets. It flung the arm into the woods. It turned Charlie over and clawed fingers gripped his leg and pulled. Searing pain and then pop, pop, one by one. It tore off his legs and flung into the distance. Charlie's body ached with the phantom pains of limbs that were no longer there. His world was a dreamy kaleidoscope of colors that swirled and blurred together with the pulse of the spaceship's lights. He felt nauseous. He'd lost a lot of blood. The trees shifted and cracked, and a second Larger alien emerged from the darkness. Four long, mottled legs stepped over the downed trees while two front legs preened the enormous head that peeked out from a heart-shaped shell. The large black eye settled on the near limbless Charlie and with a disapproving grunt, it slapped the back of the smaller alien's head. From between its pedipalps in perfect English, it said, how would you like it if someone pulled your arms and legs off? The smaller alien grumbled something to itself, yanked Charlie's last arm off with a pop, 
pop, and flung the limb into the woods. It dropped him onto the ground and the aliens shambled towards the spacecraft. The bigger one reached into its purse and produced a small remote. With the press of a button, the aliens shrank to the size of his parents' minivan and boarded the ship. The engines flared and in a flash of light, the spaceship was gone, leaving a bright, fading beam of light leading into space. Charlie lay on the cold forest floor, a wriggling torso with a head. He watched the extraterrestrial light fade from the night sky. Karma is a bitch. Rob stood on the front lawn and admired the house. The place was small, but cheap and that suited him. He wasn't looking for anything nice. This would be a short-term arrangement. He was 25 and moving back home, but he'd try to make the best of it. To Rob, it was less about his age or feeling like a failure and more about his hometown. The place was rotten. He was sure of it. You could feel it when you entered the city limits, a sinking feeling like an undertow. The town wanted to swallow you, lock you away. No matter how far you traveled, Dog River pulled you back. He tried to escape once, straight out of high school. He packed his bags and headed south for a fresh start, but it didn't work out. And the town siren song called to him refusing to let him go. I'm glad you called. We're leaving town for the weekend. The young man climbed out the window of his Cadillac and shook Rob's hand. A pretty blonde sat in the passenger seat. Rob nodded to her and she smiled back. The owner dropped dead in the field out back right below the pines that bordered the property. Now his son wanted to sell the last thing tethering him to the town. He was looking to make his escape like everyone else. As far as I can figure, they built her in the 30s. It's a fixer-upper. The son handed him the keys. I like a challenge, at least the idea of one. Most of the houses in the town were old anyway. Most everything is old in this town. He patted Rob on the shoulder and climbed into the car. Rob listened to the girl squeal as the car sped down the road. He sighed and unloaded his life from the truck. The move was easy. He lived a Spartan existence. All of his belongings fit into the back of his truck and he'd buy what he didn't have from the thrift store in town. By sunset, he moved everything into the house and unpacked what he needed for the next few days. He set his fold-out camp chairs on the back porch next to the beer cooler. His reward for a hard day's work, Rob popped open a camp chair, then popped open his drink and sat down. His brother Dan was supposed to help him move in and share in the beer, but as usual, he failed to show. Rob told him he didn't need the help, but Dan insisted he'd be there. Oh well. Rob took a long tug of beer and admired the sunset. At least the view was nice, he thought. He watched the sun shrink behind the stand of pine trees, where he saw it, a flickering white speck high in the trees. The thing hung from tree branches like a child's kite whatever the thing was. Rob walked across the porch and the field to the trees. He grabbed a branch and climbed. When he reached the spot, the thing was gone. A trick of the light. He walked back towards the house, sat in the chair and grabbed his beer. The thing was back. The hell is that? He leaned forward and squinted like he'd help him see better. 
the orb dangled among the branches. The light it made spun, twinkle, and flickered. He walked to the trees, the orb never leaving his sight. He climbed the tree, pushing through the branches to the spot. He was sure he'd seen it. Nothing. Rob searched the tree, but couldn't find anything. The orb disappeared. What the hell are you doing in that tree? His brother Dan stood on the back porch, one of Rob's beers in his hand. I keep seeing this light in the trees. The thing is, it's gone before I climb up. What are you talking about? You're up there with it. The cold light of the orb crept over his shoulder. Something clapped Rob on the back. Welcome to Dog River. He saw the town of Dog River and the light drifting through the sky, catching in the trees. The orb drew closer. We can never leave, even in death. The town always calls you back.